All righty. Hello? Oh, there we go. All right. So, <coughs> <coughs> sorry. Um, previously, uh, we were talking about um, things like resonance and beating. We learned that resonance, um, well, we learned two things about it. One, I'll say the term um, to mean when the driving term matches a solution of the homogeneous um, equation, and also to mean when um, the we have a physical system driven at the same frequency as our um, uh, as the freak as the system wants to respond. Now, there was one thing I stuffed up in the last lecture. I was a little naughty with this example. Ah, the the reason um, people pointed this out to me and said, "Well, what happens if your initial conditions are such that you start up here, you are going to get a decay appearing?" Which is exactly true. I was rushing through the example, and I should have applied initial. Come on, scroll. I should have applied initial conditions that get rid of A and B for this picture to be true, right? So I want to clarify that this is a circumstance where you've got um, no contribution from the homogeneous. Uh, Oh, whoops. No, that's not, that's not actually right either. Sorry. This is not A and B equals zero. This is where Y naught uh, equals Y dash naught equals zero, right? And you can see that that's how I've drawn it out. Now, it's important to note that you could also just have initial conditions that start up here and you end up down here in your long in the long run so right so there's some right you could end up with that as your initial condition or as your solution from the initial condition. So you don't get growth towards saturation unless you start from initial conditions that give you that behavior. All right? So that's the thing that I So that's the thing that I needed to clarify from last lecture if you were confused. Um, today what we're going to do is we're going to conclude our discussion of second order um, ODEs. I'm going to skip variation of parameters. Um, it's interesting. I suggest you read it in the notes because it's cool, but you're not expected to know it and you're not going to see the tutorial on it, which means that people, um, well, most of you are um, sort of a ch lagging a chute because of the first week. Um, so the tutorial seven is an opportunity to synchronize your tutorial with the content. So most of you will start seeing the same material. You should all start seeing the same material and then doing a tute on it, rather than being sort of a week behind with the with the tutes, which is slightly annoying. All right, so. What we're going to do first is we're going to consider some other resonance examples. So, oh, the other thing, I forgot my other laptop today, so I'm going to flick back and forth. This is the worked example that we're going to study. Copy. Paste. Right. Um, this, I think, is out of one of the practice tests. Practice test two is now available for you. Um, this question might still be on there. 
<clears throat> we have a second order constant coefficient in homogeneous problems. So we go about solving it in a usual way. We solve the associated homogeneous problem. Um, which is dy h dt squared plus 2 dy h dt plus y h of t equals 0, right? We all know how to put subscripts on and write a 0 on the, on the other side. We do our usual thing of substituting y equals e to the lambda t to obtain the auxiliary equation. We can then solve that auxiliary equation. And we find one repeated root, right? So this is a slightly annoying special case of our solution where we've got to remember that our general solution looks like a plus b to the t all multiplied by the exponential. So our general solution in this case is uh, yh all right and we notice a problem um, we actually noticed we might even notice two problems so I've got it highlighted I'll just rub it out the driving term is e to the minus t, right? It's not a sinusoidal forcing. This isn't an oscillatory system, but it is an equa it's just, it's just some equation. However, we are somehow forcing the equation with a term that matches the solution in our homogeneous problem. So we cannot proceed with our naive guess of yp equals a constant times c e to the minus t. Can anyone see a bigger problem on the horizon? Yep, so we can't do our usual rescue attempt. What do you think we do? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you just keep multiplying by t until your problems go away. It all works out because of the product rule cancelling stuff out, right? You keep differentiating and you keep getting terms that look like te to the t and its derivatives. So you get a t, uh, you get a, sorry, you get t squared e to, the t, e to the minus t. You'll get a t, e to the minus t type term and then you'll get the pure exponentials, right? That's just from the product rule and the structure of the equation is such that the exponential terms and the t times exponential terms will cancel out, but you'll still be left with a t squared. And that's what saves you. That's what lets you um, work out those undetermined coefficients um, and, and solve the problem. Try yp equals uh, t squared c naught e to the minus t. Okay, so then you need yp prime. So differentiate the first one, leave the second one alone. 
And then you add it to the derivative of the second one, leaving the first one alone. So you get minus c naught t squared e to the minus t. Do it again twice for the second derivative. Differentiate this one, differentiate the first function, leave the second one alone. Um, so that's 2c naught e to the minus t. Um, then you've got to differentiate the second function, leave the first one at minus 2c naught t e to the minus t. Then you're going to start doing this one. You're going to pick up a minus 2c naught t e to the minus t, right? So you know that you can combine those two bits. Um, then finally, you get a plus c naught t squared e to the minus t. Are we all comfortable with that? I haven't made a mistake. I don't actually know because I don't have my pre-prepared notes to compare to. Looks good. Um, I know what the answer is. and I know how to get there. So I should be able to pick up on mistakes if I've made them. So let's now substitute this in. And find, um, so it's uh, 2 second derivative yp dt squared, there's 2 here, alright, so now we're going to sub in for our particular and make this um, equation work for C naught. Um, 2C naught e to the minus t minus 4C naught t e to the minus t plus C naught t squared e to the minus t plus two of these. Alright, so that's plus 4c naught t e to the minus t. Excellent. So that's going to cancel with that one. Um, now I should get a um, minus 2c naught um, t squared e to the minus t. Um, and then finally, from the um, particular solution, um, for the, the y term itself, I should have plus uh, c naught t squared e to the minus t equals e to the minus t. Alrighty, so let's now check the butcher's bill for this. That cancels with that. Then I've got two terms that add up to cancel with this term here. Whoopee, we happy? I am. Because now what I've got is just the same functional form on both sides of my equal sign. I know that this equation is going to have solution. I mean, it's obvious C0 is a half. Um, and then my guess has, has panned out acceptably. So our overall general solution looks like this. Right, and now we have to apply our initial conditions, which were y naught equals one, dy dt equals 
Zero. Are the motion activated? I think the switch is behind there. Can someone in the back row go up and have a look and see if there's like light switch, please? Thank you. Why they didn't make it controllable from the desk, I don't actually know. Oh, it is controllable from the desk. Come back. Thank you, sorry. I found my light switch. Is that okay? Like, it's different lighting now. That's okay? All right. So we have to apply this and this. So um, I don't think any constants are going to help me. I don't think any of them are going to go away. So I'm just going to differentiate my function straight away and note that dy dt equals like so. So if this is 0, then minus a plus b 0, 0, and 0. OK, so. That tells us A is equal to B. Do we agree? And the last one, um, Y of 0, um, so that's A times E to the T, which is 0. Um, the B term disappears because there's a 0 there, plus Oh, nothing. So A is equal to 1. So B is equal to 1. Y equals 1 plus T into the minus T. Oh, actually, I can write it even neater. Okay. So this is an example. It's probably it's the worst case scenario for um, the idea of mathematical resonance, where you've got the driving term corresponding to your um, homogeneous problem, the solution of your homogeneous problem. There's also no real um, analog for beating in these cases. Um, the beating phenomenon, or the, the sort of interference and whatever, that really comes from the fact that we've got an oscillatory system, right? It's a physical, it's a physical interpretation of a particular system which exhibits this oscillatory behavior. So here, you've just got a polynomial being killed off by an exponential, right? That's the behavior of your solution in this case, right? You've got some sort of parabola that's trying to go up, and it's getting whacked down by this exponential term.
So I don't have anything more to say on that. Are there any questions at this point? Are we all happy? Got the same answer last year. Excellent. Aha. This was a good um, question that somebody asked in the lecture last year. Um, and I think it's worth discussing. The question was, what happens if you guess a YP that is more difficult than you needed to, or more complicated than required? So, um, to illustrate this, um, I've just come up with an, a very simple example problem which we'll work through now. Suppose my P So I guess this isn't making an incorrect, or it's not totally an incorrect guess, right? So it's a different type of behavior. You won't necessarily get a contradiction. You will get something consistent, right? And there's actually no mistake here. Even though you might have guessed a more complicated function than you needed to, and you end up doing more work than you need to, the answer still pans out to be correct. So, just consider the following example. Um, oops. I think I had a three in the previous one, but let's use one. Okay, so here's our example. We know the solution of the homogeneous problem. Right. That's a simple harmonic motion, right-hand side. I am somewhat relying on experience. However, what it really says is dy squared, sorry, d squared y dt squared is equal to minus y. All right? for the homogeneous problem. That should scream sinusoidal solutions at you. Second derivative is equal to the negative of the function. Right? The two functions with that property are sine and cosine. So you should be able to solve this one pretty quickly. Now, we have a zeroth order polynomial as our right hand side. A constant is a polynomial of zeroth order. So what we would normally guess is that yp equals a constant. We'd plug that in and we'd find the value of our constant. Not difficult. But let's say we guess a linear function instead. Right? Or a straight line function. Not an affine function. Not linear. Fun fact, this doesn't preserve superposition. Shit. Um, so we go and plug this in. We differentiate it twice. And we substitute in. So we have C0 plus C1t equals 1, which implies C0 equals 1, C1 equals zero. <clears throat> That's cool because what we found is that the complicating bit that we guessed by mistake has disappeared. Now that's fine because our guess was not incorrect in the sense that we still guessed a constant plus something else, right? 
but the something else isn't necessary. And so the method of undetermined coefficients actually tells us that. Right, so I guess if you're concerned about making some of these guesses, guessing on the more complicated side rather than on the simple side is somehow uh, less error prone. Probably not that less error prone because you've got more calculation and there's more opportunity for you to stuff things up. So do try and get the guess correct, but sometimes if you get something that's too complicated, um, it'll still pan out. Does that make sense? All right. I believe that's the last thing that I had to say about second order ODEs. Oh no. Something else. Yeah, I'll just point at this example just to ram the idea home. This ODE is yet another resonance case. You go through and you solve the homogeneous problem and you find solutions that look like exponentially decaying sinusoids. You're trying to drive it with an exponentially decaying sinusoid. They're going to match, right? I guess this example is trying to highlight that no matter what the solution of your homogeneous problem, you are going to run into trouble if your driving term matches the solution of your homogeneous problem, right? It's definitely this mag uh, mathematical resonance case. We've seen an example, on the other hand, where we tried driving a system like this with a sign. Right? That was in our, in our last lecture. It was the example that I started with today, which I had to correct because I was a Muppet. We see that if we drive a damped oscillator with a sinusoid, a pure sinusoid, we just get a nice, happy solution without a resonance case. Right? In this case, we're actually forcing with exactly the same... Um, term as our um, homogeneous problem, right? It's a deliberate example. Okay. Um, the last thing that might actually be worth doing. Let's think about this. Um, I'm cooking this example up on the fly, by the way, so hopefully I get it right. I'll use my favorite, um, my favorite uh, right hand side. I'm um, left hand side. Um, and. No, that's too hard. Right, let's go with this. Right. What I'm going to illustrate here is how to deal with products of functions that you know about. Right. I think I said very briefly at the start of my discussion on, in homoge on, on undetermined coefficients that products work as you expect. But let's actually illustrate this with a proper example. Right, homogeneous problem. Right, do we all agree with that? So there's two ways to check it. Um, 
one the easiest is just to look at their it's to kind of see the characteristic equation in here and remember that you've got um, a quadratic and remember your rules for quadratics this is and this is Probably, yep. Yes, it is. Thank you. Because I need them to add up. I, I need them to add up to be minus 5 and multiply out to be 6. Oh, but that makes these plus, right? Yeah, no. It, that's the one I want. Because then my factorization, yeah, I did have this run the right way. Because my factorization would be lambda plus 2, lambda plus 3. So my lambda values are minus 2 and minus 3. I make that mistake all the time, right? It's a good one to watch. Um, because you, you think that, that that's the factorization, but then you've got to remember that lambda is negative to actually make the term 0. Yeah, don't fall into that trap. That said, I'm sure you'll find a practice example problem where I've actually done it. I've been deleting them out of this course since, um, since 2018. So our YP, what we would guess, we've got a polynomial, a first order polynomial multiplied by an exponential. Right? So what we guess is a first order polynomial multiplied by an exponential. But we guess the most general one. We guess the most general first order polynomial. And usually we would then guess this. Um, for the exponential, a constant multiplied by an exponential of the same exponent. Right? Without loss of generality, obviously we can just decide that this C2 is 1, right? The information is carried by C0 and C1 anyway, right? This just corresponds to, you know, going in here, going in here. These coefficients are to be determined, so we don't actually need this one. Does that make sense? Yep. So we proceed, we differentiate. Um... So that's the first derivative, second derivative, yeah, we happy with that? We pick up the second C1 e to the t from the product rule of this one. So then we've got uh, plus five of these. Then we've got six of our original guess. And then we've got T e to the T. All right. So this is a line continuation um, because it's, it's long. All right. So there's a couple of ways we can simplify this. Um, well, we can just, the, the answer when we do simplify it, C0 plus 2C1, um, 6C0, 
12 C naught. Um, how many C ones? Two, seven, seven, thirteen. Um, and then this T ones, we got one of them here, six from there, twelve. Okay, so now we can equate like terms. We've got a T e to the T on the left and the right hand side. So we can find C1 immediately. Um, C1 has to be equal to 1 over 12. Now we need this term to disappear. And so we can find C0 that makes that happen. So um, we have 12 C0 um, equals negative 13 over 12. C0 equals negative 13 over 144. Okay, that's not a very pretty number but it's the one we get. So our general solution um, um, minus 13 over 144 e to the uh, e to the t my plus t on 12 e to the t all right when we substitute come on when we substitute back into our original guess for yp okay so that's just what happens when you find a product, it's a nice worked example um, for what you do with the right hand side. If you see function 1 multiplied by function 2, you take the guesses for function 1, multiply them by the guess for function 2, sort out the extra constants that you don't need, and then proceed. Okay. Going to refer back now to the 2021 lecture because it's got a nice summary written out already. <clears throat> so are there any final questions on second order, linear, constant coefficient, ODEs? Yep. You'll either have a table or a reminder of what you're supposed to guess. Um, unless I've decided to torture you through something, um, but then the question will usually have instructions. Right. And again, you'll, the guess will be heavily entered. So I guess you're worried about memorizing the table. Don't do that. Okay. So here's a summary of ODEs. You learned about the, the basic classification mechanism for ODEs. Order, independent and dependent variables, um, linear or nonlinear. I've really stressed what linear means in the sense of an operator because I think it's an important fact that you should take away. Right? Linearity preserves superposition. That means addition works as we expect it to, right? We have this intuitive sense of addition, and in linear problems, that holds. And that's basically what lets us solve a hell of a lot of problems. We saw three classes of first order ODE. We saw a directly integrable ODE, where essentially you're given the derivative of your dependent variable equals some function of the independent variable. You just integrate both sides and you're done. 
We saw separable ODEs, which can be managed in this way. You can get all the Ys on one side, all the Ts on the other, and you can integrate that. And you'll get a solution. That's usually more challenging. The challenges are doing the integrals, right? Once you've done the integrals, you've got at least some sort of implicit solution. One, um, it may be a pain to sort out your dependent variable to get an ex a nice explicit expression. You don't always get that. Right? So you might have to tolerate some level of implicit solution. We learned about first order linear ODEs. Now, we didn't see many examples of this because once you have the, the, the problem in canonical form, you can solve that canonical form in general, right? So we have two functions, unknown or unspecified, they're arbitrary. Um, we are assuming that P and Q are integrable, right? That's a condition because we do actually integrate these things. Um, we learned that if we multiply our equation by this magic function r of t, we turn our ODE into a directly integrable one, which then we can integrate. It's a problem already solved. This idea is called the integrating factor. It's more general than simply first order linear. First order linear always admit this integrating factor solution. But there are a number of other problems, a number of other ODEs, non-linear ones included, that do admit this integrating factor. So you do see this solution technique coming up a fair bit, even in sort of more complicated and more difficult problems. So it's a good idea to have that in your head, that you might be able to multiply your problem by a function and get a simpler problem. Right? That's the, that, I think, is the true moral of the, the integrating factor story. Um, however, you can obviously write down a solution to any first order linear ODE, provided that your P and Q are integrable. We learned about the logistic equation. We saw this quite a bit. We saw a solution by separation. We saw slope fields of it. We saw equilibria and, and critical point behavior that we could draw down a phase line. Um, we could classify the stability. We could modify the logistic equation with a harvesting term, and we can still make comments on the long-term behavior of these solutions without actually solving the ODE, right? So we used the logistic equation as kind of a prototype for a lot of analysis with phase planes, slope fields, and so on. But obviously, you can apply the idea of phase planes to any autonomous ODE or first-order ODE and generalizations of the phase line to second order ODEs, systems of ODEs, and so on. Autonomous means that there's no function of time alone, so there's, it doesn't feature in the equation. There's no g of t messing this up. And that essentially just means that there's some um, time varying thing, right? You need this to be. Uh, if you're going to tend to an equilibrium, right, obviously that's time independent, right? So you need that out of your solution, of, of your ODE. Any questions about first order ODEs? Are we all cool with them? All right. Second order ODEs. We firstly looked, or we, we very quickly particularized to constant coefficient and linear, right? Um, we then said that the equation was homogeneous if there was no zero, if there was no function of t alone on the right-hand side or in the equation, um, and inhomogeneous otherwise. We learned one technique for approaching these called undetermined coefficients, which I've been banging on about for a couple of weeks. We start with a guess, right? We start by guessing a solution to a homogeneous problem as e to the lambda t, right? Exponential has the nice property that the derivatives of exponential are just exponentials. 
What we have when we take a second order constant coefficient ODE is just a sum of derivatives, right? So in our heads, this exponential is going to be a good fit for that pattern of derivatives. We can simplify out once we've substituted in and we get something called the characteristic or auxiliary equation. They're synonymous. The next thing we can do is we can find three classes of solution. The overdamped solution where we have um, exponential solutions. The critically damped solution where we have a T -E exponential type solution. Or the complex case where we find complex eigenvalues, we rewrite our complex exponentials as sine plus cosine to get a real looking solution, right? To get a real solution. Then what we can do is if we've got an inhomogeneous type, uh, an inhomogeneous problem, we can guess a solution of y particular based on what that g of t is. You've seen them for sines and cosines, polynomials, and exponentials, and that's pretty much it, right? If you get a tan on the right-hand side, um, you're not going to probably be able to make the appropriate guess that gives you the solution. You need to check for resonance cases. If you've got a resonance case, multiply by t to get your better guess. The last thing we saw was a bunch of physical behavior associated with driven oscillator systems. So you saw that you could get beating when you drove the oscillator with a frequency which was not its natural or resonant frequency. You saw resonance when the oscillator was undamped. You could get a linear growth to um, infinite amplitude. And you also saw the possibility of damping that resonant solution. So you're driving a, 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 an oscillator which has, if you like, a natural frequency the same as the driving frequency, but you're damping it somehow um, and removing energy from the system so you don't get um, a blow up in amplitude. Okay, so that is our ODEs. Um, tomorrow you have a little holiday, um, and the day after that we will um, start talking about multivariate calculus. Yes. I'll copy that across, and I've forgotten about you. Yeah, okay, I've actually another question uh, about that. Um, just with the energy of these cases, how do you, how can you tell me the need to take this off? So, uh, what's the difference between these Oh, so it's the presence of a driving term on the right hand side.